Welcome everyone. Welcome to our final lecture for the spring 2021 term. Uh, this is, a, it's been a lot of fun. I'm, I hope you've seen the others. And if you haven't, you can visit our School of Architecture and Planning YouTube uh, station uh, where all of our lectures, including uh, ones from previous years are archived. And this lecture will also be on our YouTube channel. So if you wanna go back and watch it or recommend it to friends, it'll be there. Today, we're really excited. We have a very, very special uh, guest lecturer. And uh, many of you are wondering like what Dean Marianne Alabanza Akers does with her free time when she's not um, doing all of the things it takes to make our school run and a million meetings and a million initiatives and keeping everything together. And many of you know how challenging that is. Um, but when she's not doing all of that or not answering your questions or meeting with you, she's spending that spare weekend time writing, right? So she's, she's spending her spare time writing books, it turns out, and on some pretty interesting topics. And that's why we've invited her in today to share her, her recent book, and I'm going to just pull up the information on it, and I'm going to place a link to the uh, Routledge, uh, I'll place it in the chat, the link to the Routledge uh, page for her book. So her book is called Urban Environments and Health in the Philippines, a Retrospective on Women Street Vendors and Their Spaces. And uh, I know this is a very involved project with research stretching over a lot of years. And I think we're all gonna be really interested to see this. Uh, for those of you, I know we have some special guests in the audience, people who are getting up very early from halfway around the world. So welcome. Um, we're really excited to have you as well. And uh, many of you already know Dean Akers' background, but I'll, I'll just uh, paraphrase a little bit about some of the things that she's done particularly those things that she did and her background from before she joined Morgan 14 years ago. Um, uh, Marianne Akers is the Dean of Morgan State School of Architecture and Planning. She is well under the influence of an architect father and a social worker slash psychologist mother, well, which marks her strong interest in uh, city design and people. She has degrees in urban planning, sociology, and creative writing, over 40 years of professional and academic experience. And uh, she's done some very interesting projects, many of them uh, at, while she was at the University of Georgia, including the Atlanta Project, led by former President Jimmy Carter. Uh, she also did a micro enterprise program project for the Center for Black Women's Wellness in Atlanta and other nonprofits across Georgia. And she's also spearheaded uh, the initiative called Claiming a Street Name King. It's a broad project that examines all the MLK streets in the state of Georgia. And I know we've, we've talked about doing that here and uh, expanding that. One of these days, we're going to expand it across the US. Um, and she's been involved in a lot of revitalization plans, as you know, both here in, in Maryland and before in Georgia. So it is my pleasure now to introduce Marianne Al Alabanza Akers, Dean of the School of Architecture of Planning at Morgan State University. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. That was a very good introduction. Um, I'll, some people here don't know me as Dean Akers. <laughs> they know me as Mary Ann Alabanza, tiny Mary Ann. So thank you for all those who, um, who are here. I know it's a nice warm day and you're spending your indoors here, uh, watching, not watching, but I would like to make this more of a conversation. But um, I would like to just start off with my screen. Um, Okay, uh, where is, okay. You know what, I haven't mastered this yet. So 
I will be very informal. That's usually the way that I give my talks. Um, but, okay, let me read. Wait, uh, there, okay. The Baguio Mountains of my youth beckons, a persistent gentle tapping on my memory soul. Spirits of wind, water, earth and sky whisper in silence, come back to us. The melodious call of pine trees bristle. I listen with my heart to the city's rhythms, harmonies that resonate in my conscious dreams. For these chants carry the mythical urban ballads of my youth, echoing their truths, permeating into my being. As my memory breathes these all in, I am transformed once again. The Cordillera spirits are calling. I am reminded that I am a child of the mountains. Welcome to this lecture on urban environments and health. Um, let me, oops, why is it not going forward there? <clears throat> Basically as uh, Dan said, this is about the book that was recently published, Urban Environment and Health in the Philippines, a retrospective on women street vendors and their spaces. I just have a qualifying statement here. Um, <clears throat> well, first of all, I would like to acknowledge uh, Mohamed Garipour, who actually opened the doors uh, for me to publish this book as part of his series, um, Health and Design. I also want to acknowledge obviously my family uh, who have pestered me, particularly my husband, Tim, who has pestered me. Hey, you've got to write this book, okay? <laughs> so um, I acknowledge them and of course my family in New Jersey, New York, West Virginia, and of course in the Philippines. And my father who's 93 years old and is still in Baguio. The qualifying statement here, when I started writing this book, it took me from the submission of the um, proposal to the actual publication, I would say about a year and a half maybe, um, a year and a half to two years. But my purpose for writing this book was not only about myself, that I needed to um, you know, write uh, you know, all the things that I have done, the study that I have uh, built on, but particularly, I wanted to make sure that this book reached the people in Baguio City. But when I saw the price in Amazon, I said, what the $160? No way, I can't even afford it. So those who want my book, wait till next year. <laughs> It's going to go down. Um, but anyway, so just qualifying statement. Philippines in a global context. Those who don't know much about where the Philippines is, um, it's right there on the other side of the world. It's a country of 7,107 islands on, um, I guess, when it's high tide and then uh, eight maybe when it's low tide, but we are an archipelago. The site, the project site is Baguio City, which is north of the capital, Manila. How did I get interested in street vendors? It all started when I was about two or three years old. When, first of all, I, my childhood was spent in the market because my family had a lot of different souvenir shops scattered throughout. And my mom, who's like psychologist and social work, who was a psychologist and social worker, um, also had this, uh, this uh, souvenir shop 
um, as a way to augment our income. And that's where we would grow up. But I was about two or three years old. I followed our sales girl out of our store. And all I remember that day, I still, it's still kind of vivid in my memory, the sights and I mean, all these colors and the sounds were just like, I was so amazed. And before I knew it, um, the sales girl was gone because um, I wasn't following her anymore. I was distracted by all this multitude of sounds and all these, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, colors and all these different products. And I started to cry. And that's where the street vendors actually um, recognized me. They recognized me as my mother's daughter. So they knew, oh, that's Alabanza. So they took me back to our store. For some reason, that's how I got very, very interested in vending in micro enterprises. So this started in 1999, and it was a building of, of this particular longitudinal study. It almost every two years, I would add a dimension to the study, and it ended in 2009. I am so glad that I did not write this book immediately after 2009. Why? It would have been another one of those books, just data, you know, analysis, without any deep reflection on it. So I'm glad this was really the, the best time for me to reflect, to think deeper into what this study was about. Research authenticity is found throughout the book. I, and I'll just read it very, very uh, fast. <laughs> In the critical analysis and interpretation of places, one ought to consider the role and positionality that the researcher plays in forming a perspective and constructing knowledge. In the early phase of my academic experience, I carried insecurities about my value as a Filipina researcher. The effects of colonialization on my intellectual worth meant that I complied and I deferred to Western scholars who studied various aspects of Philippine life and society. But I found their scholarship to be lacking in depth and context. As I matured professionally, professionally and intellectually, I gained the confidence to question, to critique their interpretations. I have become a judicious academic and I am determined to stand up and be heard. So in this talk, I'll talk, I'll, I'll just focus on two, two, I would say, themes that run throughout the book, transdisciplinary research and decolonization. So let's talk about transdisciplinarity. You will hear it over and over again. It's like, it's the new term, but people usually don't know what it truly means. They, tr they, they take transdisciplinarity and interdisciplinarity as if they're synonymous. But here's just a graphic that shows you have your disciplines here, you have <clears throat> multidiscipline, um, multiple disciplines that relate to each other, but at a distance. And then you have your interdisciplinary teams where, yeah, sure, there are overlaps, but in the long run, it's just, um, disciplines getting together. Here is where the, I would say the higher level of um, constructing knowledge comes. That is the blending of all the disciplines. There's a lot of arguments that come with transdisciplinarity um, because your terms, if you're from different disciplines, your terms, you may be talking about the same thing, but you, term it differently. In transdisciplinarity, it is really the blending and it does take time. It just doesn't happen overnight. So in this particular study, this is the research areas. We had uh, socioeconomic life. We asked the vendors uh, why they chose the locations uh, they, they did and it 
and I found out that they don't stay there, that depending on the season, they move. Depending on the hierarchy of vendors, they move. Um, the vending history, relationships with formal businesses, which is, is very critical when you study uh, street vendors. Uh, health conditions, medical conditions, air quality, we did that as well. Street material culture, street life and behavior. Talk about different disciplines. And of course, the site conditions. Every time I would go home, I would have uh, an aspect of the study that looked at site conditions. Here are the methods. Again, very transdisciplinary, very transdiscipline. Um, observations, of course, you, we had surveys. I would say if I had to tally it, it's more than 400 surveys that we have done at various uh, times with personal interviews, uh, visual documentation. We even had air quality monitoring, um, behavior tracking, case studies. So again, very, very interdisciplinary. Our team were composed of social scientists, environmental scientists, urban planner, um, that's me, <laughs> nurses, medical doctor, medical student, and a health researcher. Oops, I missed a comma there. But again, it's from different disciplines, the social scientists, and this is part of those who are going through decolonization. Um, I used the local research resources that we had. The University of the Philippines in Baguio had the Cordillera Studies Center, which is a research unit of the university. And that's where I hired uh, anthropologists and sociologists and um, it, um, political scientists and um, even economists. Because again, you know, as, as a, I would say a betweener, uh, that's another term for people who have left the global south and have come here, uh, but they're still in between. Um, I felt that I needed the local, the local perspective to um, the, the, the people and the places that I studied because I left the Philippines in 1984. And obviously in 1999, things changed. So what is transdisciplinarity? It's the stewing of data, analysis, and reflection. And that's what makes a study transdisciplinary. One thing, I love food, as you can see, um, it takes time, as I said, it just doesn't happen overnight because the cross-sectionality and the argumentations that have to take place, the dozens of uh, discussions that have to take place, all of that are somehow blended like a stew. But here's the difference. The difference is, if you notice, each of these ingredients, the carrots, the, the potatoes, the celery, the beef, all of these still keep their identity. So the, in transdisciplinarity, they still have to have their discipline. They have to be still rooted in their discipline. But then again, they transform into, or tr they transcend into something more, um, more blended than their own discipline. So that's that. And one thing that transdisciplinarity um, that many people don't really um, grasp is there's because of the blending and the stewing of all the ideas and perspectives, something comes out of it. It's not like interdisciplinary where, yeah, you talk, you overlap, but what new thing emerges out of the blending and stewing? The thing that I would say in, in this particular study that came out is the urban place node. Again, it had to take place uh, way, way after the data gathering was done. The urban place node, that's a tool that I use to really look at the different sites. And I'll, I'll, I'll just uh, 
define it. Uh, intensified focal spaces that mark the intersectionality of place, people, and health. Again, it's the blending, it's the stewing. And Urban Place Node is how I, 20 years from the first, first year that I started this study, how I looked and um, developed this retrospective. So here's what a trans, uh, here's what an urban place node is. I'll, I'll read again very, very quickly. Um, this book offers a holistic retrospective view of place to understand the built environment and to elicit the health implications of urban spaces on women vendors. The concept of urban place node is a valuable transdisciplinary tool that teaches us how to take a frame of urban street life. It involves a quick snapshot of dense material. Can you imagine all the material that I gathered, including air quality and life stories and live experiences of vendors? All of that was all in a frame. Um, dense material, cultural cues that reflect conditions of downtown streets. And here's again um, the value of an authentic researcher of the place. And that is there are cues that people not of the place wouldn't even catch. So I'll give an example. Um, those who know Baguio City, if you see a red spot somewhere, you may not, those, those who are not of the place would wonder what is that red spot? And of course, we know that's beetle nut, right? So again, these are cues that normally a person not of the place won't even catch. Um, place nodes has special rhythms. Every site is different. Every node is different, but they are very complex, they're dynamic, and they're very interconnected. Here is a uh, um, British um, the uh, theorist, Doreen Mars Massey, and she says that people have manifold identities so do places. And that's why these urban place nodes, which is again, a, a, um, uh, a an outcome of the transdisciplinarity um, process that the study went through, um, have multifaceted identities that reflect society and the impact of globalization on Philippine urbanism. I, um, what I did was I, rather than take, we had 33 sites, but I kind of grouped them together to characterize them in a more general way. And that's again, the urban place node. So I, ha I had five where upper session road, middle session road, lower session road, Malcolm Square, Abanao and General Luna. Each of these are unique. They have their own identities. They're very dynamic as well. I will just talk about three because I really want this to be more of a conversation. So let's take Upper Session Road. If you look at this, uh, if, if you look at my arrow, this is Upper Session Road. It's, I would say it's a historic road because when the Americans came, and I'll talk more about uh, our history, um, when the Americans came, they're very typical of Europeans um, and Americans. They couldn't stand the heat. The Philippines is a, is a tropical country. So they had to look just like in India, right, Sid? Um, ju uh, just like the British, they had to look for hill stations. And so Baguio was perfect for this, for the Americans. <coughs> so they made this the summer, uh, sort of the summer capital, because that's where they had their sessions, um, uh, the imperial government, the American imperial government. And so session road was actually designed so that um, the Americans came from the top of session road, a, a point there, all the way to the city hall. And that's why it's called Session Road because of the 
um, the sessions, the summer sessions. So even here, for example, it's very different from all the other nodes. There's a big um, um, uh, shoe mart. Uh, oh, what, what's the term they use now? It's a big commercial um, in the Philippines. It's a big conglo conglomerate, um, a commercial establishment. But anyway, um, most of the people either come down from there and see this bag here that you can uh, uh, immediately identify that as coming from Schumart. Um, but then there are, also, there are also schools and colleges on this side up, and you will find a lot of students as well. Um, Session Road is very different. If you notice the street art here, it's the only street in, in Baguio, well, not in Baguio, but in downtown Baguio, that actually has an intentional street um, uh, installation. This upper session road also is very different in that um, during the Christmas season, that's where many of the vendors actually set up place. And that's also because of the volume of traffic, of pedestrian traffic, and the width of the sidewalk. The second node is Abanao Magsaysay, um, close to the market. Um, but this node is also different in that it is the intersection of major streets. Um, I just wanted to show you some of what the vendors would do. Some of the vendors would carry their goods from either the market or from their homes to their place of work. Or some just uh, put this tarp and secure it. Um, now, when it comes to health, if you notice this, I, I, I'm not so sure it's kind of dark, but this is a, a woman who sells grapes. But look what's beside her. It's a trash can. And the only reason is because, I, if I'm not mistaken, she's selling also other fruit here. And the uh, fruit peels, it's best that she locates close to the trash can so that she can just throw it uh, a few feet from her. So again, I'm sh that is a health, uh, in a way, a health hazard. Here's this um, um, teenage boy who also has his own uh, micro enterprise and he's peeling corn and he has also located close to a garbage can. Very, um, again, a health hazard. Um, this is one unique feature of uh, this particular node. It's these um, elevated platforms. Um, again, I talked about the intersection of major streets and because Baguio rains, I mean, it rains a lot in Baguio. So what the local government decided to do was to put, put these actually very um, obtrusive structures um, on top of that intersection. Um, vendors in this node sell all sorts of food. Um, when we did our air quality monitoring, it turns out this is not as bad. This particular node did not have really bad um, air quality. And why? It's because it was flat. But the worst air quality was in the middle session road because of the incline of the street. I'll just briefly talk about um, General Luna, which is another uh, urban node uh, that I talk about in the book. So this is different from the two other nodes in that it is a center for schools as well as for hospitals. So if um, this is the University of Baguio over here, during that time, uh, there was the St. Louis Girls High and the Boys High. Uh, now they have moved uh, to the suburbs. Um, but here, um, this road, the Assumption Road, continues on to uh, the St. Louis Hospital. And then there's the Notre Dame Hospital. So it's really an institutional hub. But the vendors there are there because of the students. 
Um, when I interview these vendors, they, they have, again, lived experiences of, and marketing strategies. When the parents or the guardians um, wait for their students to come out of school, they actually um, talk to them and they try to market their goods. But they said that the parents are, and the guardians are not really the main decision makers here, although they hold a purse. Um, it's the kids. So when the kids are in break, oh my gosh, they, they call them into their, um, into their spot and they say, hey, you know, this is the latest gadget here. Oh, did you see this new game? Oh, did you see this new poster? So they target the kids. Here, a few feet from there is a barbecue vendor and the barbecue vendor, their target market are college students um, coming from the University of Baguio and high school students. And if you notice here, this group of young people, they came from class and they're hanging out there. Um, what's the health hazard here? Um, well, if you look closer, and I, I, I did analyze it, uh, there was really no division of the meat, the raw meat with the cooked meat and the marination pot. So right there, uh, food contamination was a health hazard. Uh, but they said so far, nobody has gotten sick from their um, from their food, so maybe they don't know, but still, <laughs> uh, according to them, it's really a big, big uh, draw um, for college students and high school students, older students. The women also at the end of General Luna, because it's an inclined street, um, have complained of muscular uh, skeletal muscular uh, pains. And that's because, again, the way that they situate themselves is, you know, one foot is kind of a few inches higher. And that has over time impacted their health. Okay, here is in front of the college, the University of Baguio. Do you see this here? This is early morning and it's a repository of trash bags and other trash. And um, that's another health hazard. But people also, vendors know that at the end of the day, um, if rather than scatter all their garbage throughout the street, they know that this is one spot that the garbage truck would uh, pass by and collect the garbage. So that's where everything is accumulated. Now, when it rains, that's also a problem because bacteria from there, and again, it's an inclined street, um, you know, would, would, would um, impact health. So let me just briefly talk about writing as an act of decolonization. Um, I just love this, this image because it does show that when you write and you reflect, and um, you really dig deep into why you are the way you are or why you think the way you think, you will get into a rhythm of decolonization. It never ends. Somebody who, who tells me, or I hear people who say, I'm a decolonized woman. Um, I say, okay, sure, but Again, maybe she feels that way, but I personally think that decolonization is a lifelong process. Just briefly, definition, of course, right? It's an academic lecture, so I should define. <laughs> decolonization is the process of deconstructing colonial ideologies of the superiority and privilege of Western thought and approaches. And that's basically what decolonization is. Very, very um, poignant uh, saying here. Your journey is not the same as mine. And my journey is not yours. 
But if you meet me on a certain path, may we encourage each other. That is um, my mantra when I talk about decolonization. Here is just for those who don't know about Philippine history, um, one, one thing that I have, part of the decolonization uh, process is knowing your history. So I went for my college and my master's to the University of the Philippines, Philippines which is like um, a very progressive um, university. It's, it's, a gov it's a public university. But when we were taught Philippine history, we were taught only the colonial part of it. If you um, see this arrow here in 1521, that's when the Spaniards came and settled in the Philippines and colonized us. Um, and then in 1946 is when the Americans left. But in 1898, that's when the Americans came and took over from Spain and became colonists and imperialists. So in my history book, this is all, not all, but this is, I would say, maybe 80% of the chapters. All these, and I don't even want to say pre-Hispanic, I want to call it the indigenous. This indigenous history, are, when I look back, I thought, oh, maybe it's about three or four pages out of maybe a 300 page history book. So again, our minds were colonized immediately by even just our history. As I mentioned, the Spaniards came in 1521. Um, they brought with them the Catholic religion. We were uh, basically a pantheistic uh, society. And mind you, we were very different from each other because we, we again, we were all settled all throughout this archipelago. Um, so that's what they did. And then the Americans came and completely, um, well, yeah, they decolon they, they colonize and they colonize us even further and deeper. So they use education, they use health, they use uh, infrastructure as a way to say, hey, you want to be civilized? Follow the American way. English, they wanted us to speak English. And that's why growing up, my parents' generation, and especially Baguio, and I'll, I'll, I'll show you why um, or how Baguio became an English-speaking um, city. But they said, you know, we want you to succeed. We want you to go to America and have your education there um, because that's the best education in the whole world. So that was what I had growing up. Um, and so we spoke English at home. But here's a very, um, I would say, uh, meaningful um, um, image where Uncle Sam is here washing us of indigenous cultures and washing us of uncivilized ways. Um, but then look here, these two Filipinos are putting See, some people interpret that as putting the American way, which is true, but at the same time, I see it as they're getting one over Uncle Sam because they're <laughs> putting his uh, clothes on and when he gets out of the water, he's not used to just going out like that. So again, um, you can interpret it some other way, but it's the mind through education um, here's a very good book, Brown Skin, White Minds. This is a Thomasite, um, the American um, uh, teachers who came uh, through the USS Thomas. That's why they're called Thomasites. But uh, the United St States felt that, oh, to be civilized, let's teach them about the American ways. I remember growing up when we had to learn the alphabet. A is for apple. Is that apple? We don't even grow apples in, in Baguio or in the Philippines. Um, or S 
is for snow. Snow? So, but we were taught that. <laughs> um, at the same time, Filipinos are very, or identify very much with uh, the Latinos and Latinas because of um, more than 300 years of Spanish colonial rule. So um, our identity is very, very multifaceted. So let me talk about Baguio because that's where the study took place. Um, this is indigenous land. Uh, in fact, Luisa and I know the Carinos, um, and they owned this land where the Americans, when they hiked up to the mountains, all of a sudden said, oh my gosh, this is paradise. This is very much um, suited to our needs. So with that said, they proclaimed Baguio as a town site, okay, and as an American um, settlement. Daniel Burnham, many of you know, uh, he was commissioned by uh, the American government who uh, paid for him to travel to the Philippines. When I looked at his diary at the at, in Chicago, um, I really, really looked at every day what he did and all that. He was so sick. He was so sick because he wasn't used to tropical weather, but he was only able to go around Baguio, around, not around Baguio yet at that time, around the site for one day. The rest of, a of the time he was in a, um, there was a, um, I think it was a, a German who um, hosted him. But he just went one day and uh, to look at the topography, to look at the site. By the way, he was not the first uh, choice of the American government. It was Olmsted who was the first choice. Olmsted would have been naturally better. But anyway, so he designed Baguio and uh, they built, the Americans built uh, these roads uh, again to um, have access to the city and, and they established it. Let's talk about decolonization. It really starts in childhood. And here's a picture of me and my mom and my two siblings. Why do I say it starts at childhood? This is our lawn. If you notice, there is a Bahay Kubo here. A Bahay Kubo is Nipa hut. It's a native hut. And if you look at this painting, it's also very um, native themed. And my dad and mom made sure that from the beginning, we had uh, really rooted in our indigenous cultures. Many of our friends, even our family would, uh, you know, mock us and say, you have such a nice lawn with all these pine trees and then you put the Nipa hut? Um, so again, that's a colonized mind. It's like you can't put anything, any, anything symbolic um, in, in your landscape. It has to be very Eurocentric. So again, it starts from when we were, from when you're young. Even the way you read cities, it is a decolonizing way of reading cities. I know um, many urban planners and urban designers would say, oh my gosh, what is this? It's messy. The pedestrians and the vehicles are all taking the same space and all that. But if that's the local culture and the way that cities organically grow, uh, who are we to say that you need to have everything uniform? Here is um, Chinatown in the Philippines. Again, it has its own character. And when you decolonize the read of cities, you go beyond, for example, all these uh, electric lines. <laughs> I know to some, and actually it, it's, it's a hazard, but look more at the cultural cues that um, really frame the, um, the local culture. Look at here, there's a basketball court. Um, it's just 
<laughs> look at the boundaries of the of the basketball court. It's uh, just painted yellow. Again, these when you decolonize your read of cities, you look at things like this as really represent representative of the local culture. Here is where a lot of global South cities are going to. The globalized uh, way of design. Everything is neat. Everything should be in its place. Everything is manicured. Um, that again is uh, a way that many urban planners and uh, urban designers in the global South should refrain from but many of them have not really gone through decolonization. So decolonizing your mind. One of the things that this book has done was really deepen, deepen my commitment to see where um, I have veered away from my indigenous roots. Um, here's just uh, again, we were very, um, I would say, female-centric uh, prior to the colonialists coming. Um, we were leaders of our tribes. Um, and this book has really, again, helped me in getting back to the spirit of my spirits of my ancestors. Um, one thing that I say in the book that's loud and clear, I really put, well, put down, maybe you can say it that way. I really put down researchers who would come to Baguio City from wherever, um, mostly from the United States, um, some from, from uh, Europe, but mostly from the United States, extract no local uh, knowledge, and then come, come back here, write about the place, but they have, again, they're not authentic, they're not researchers of the place. And as a researcher of the place, I felt that the book is good for me, but I would hope that it impacts the people in Baguio City. And so at the end of the book, it's what are my thoughts? on how to uh, revitalize, what are my thoughts to um, engage in applied, applied strategies. One of the things that I said, because I felt that, hey, I'm not just extracting knowledge and not giving something back in return. So caring capacity, our streets, not only should we look at the number of pedestrians, the number of vehicles, but the air quality as well. Baguio is not any, well, it is still, I think it is um, one of uh, the most polluted uh, cities um, in, in the Philippines, mainly because it's a highland and inversion traps, the cold air traps the exhaust from vehicles and many of our vehicles are diesel uh, fueled. So our pollution levels are almost the same as Mexico City and Mexico City is very polluted. So we need, the local government really needs to look at pollution and, um, and, and the carrying capacity of the street. Inclusive local economy. I kept going back and forth because literature shows, oh, we need to get rid of the informal economy and put them and make sure that they eventually uh, engage in the formal economy. I, I went back and forth with that, but ultimately I said, no, if you want an inclusive local economy, then let people, let the grassroots also have spaces for them to earn a livelihood. Now, obviously there must be some rules also, but we cannot completely um, uh, get rid of the street vendors in these streets. Now, what the local government has done was um, prevented them from, the, from um, 
uh, locating there. And instead they have uh, what they call the Baguio night market. I have a problem with that. Why? The Baguio night markets um, start at 9 p.m. and goes on till about, I think, midnight. But you have to rent a stall. Um, you have, there's so many rules, like you have to have a tent, you have to have all this. And these vendors, like this old woman, um, has in fact, uh, you know, she's in her space early morning. And when she is done, like around, in, in her case, uh, around 7 p.m., then she, um, you know, goes home. But other people, the average number of hours is 10 hours. But again, 10 hours compared to from 9 to 12 midnight for a night market. And even the type of products that are being sold are somehow uh, controlled as well. And women's agency. Never in the history of Baguio have we had a female mayor. I believe it's about time. Jerry, hint, hint, we need a female mayor for Baguio. Um, talk about health. Take the health services to the streets. Here's just an example of a health pod. Why can't we, you know, Baguio is a medical center. We have lots of students in training medical students, nursing students, health practitioner students, or health students, um, health science students, they can use this as part of their uh, uh, practicum, for example, but take the health services out to the streets. Why? Because when we interviewed women and we did our health surveys, many of them had um, symptoms but they only go to the hospital when it's really, really bad. And oftentimes it's too late. So if we had health monitoring at the street level, isn't that inclusiveness? And although this is Singapore, I would really suggest that we look at greening the downtown, greening downtown Baguio because of the pollution we can do what we were known for, and that's our pine trees, that's uh, fresh air. Um, and so I really would suggest that we do uh, uh, really intentional plans to green the downtown. So these, again, my book ends with specific applied strategies uh, for Baguio. So thank you and maraming salamat. Okay. I, thanks, thanks, Dr. Akers. That was really, um, that was really fantastic. It was great to, I mean, you have like three books in there and one, you have this um, incredible, uh, you have this granular look at the environment of the street vendors with a kind of ethnographic, trying to understand who they are and, and what, they, what they need to make their lives better and to make the city vibrant. And then you have this overlay of the meaning of being a kind of modern global citizen from the Philippines and uh, what that means in a post-colonial or post-post-colonial context. That's a really um, interesting, very interesting uh, kind of question to carry through, through this work. But I, I, I'm not gonna continue on. I'm gonna allow the audience to ask some questions and I'm sure there, there are some good questions here. So um, I think we have a small enough group where you can probably just turn off your turn on your microphone and yeah. ask a question. Yeah, actually, I would like to answer this question. Louisa had a question. She has to leave at five, um, but she said, "How? Okay, could you speak a little on what you think today have the greatest environmental ecological impacts on your research area? How are these connected to the idea of the urban?" And what do you see to be important indigenous responses to the ecological crisis? Woo! <laughs> that will take me a year to reflect on. But thank you, Louisa. Yes. So um, actually, I would say that the 
biggest ecological or environmental impact is just the air, air quality. We know it was bad, but we didn't really know how bad. And if we, now that we know, because we did have an experiment where uh, there was one day in December where they closed Session Road and our air quality monitoring uh, lenses showed zero pollutants. And again, just that particular study, that particular uh, component of the study, I think, is one of those. And then, of course, going back to ecology and greening the downtown. And um, so that's, again, we, we really need to go back to our indigenous roots. And indigenous roots is a very complicated and multifaceted, uh, um, not even concept, but uh, condition, I guess, because what is indigenous? What is really indigenous? Jerry, maybe you can talk more about that because Jerry is um, from um, Bontoc, but uh, she, she and I sometimes, when I go home, um, we talk more about this. Um, but uh, yes, so greening, I think greening the downtown is very, very important. And just going back to the micro enterprise inclusiveness um, of earning a living, I think is very important. Marianne, I had a question. Uh, the United States left uh, Philippines in 1946. So that's been over 75 years. So how, how I mean, I, I'm a little surprised that what you call is your uh, lecture scene that what you call that we are still colonized. We still have a colonized mentality. I don't see that uh, in India because, you know, I consider myself post-colonial and have no baggage about the British. So I'm just wondering why that has persisted because of continuous relationship with the mm -hmm. United States and the new colonial thing or what is it? What makes the, even the current generation, what you call have the colonial mentality, mentality and not be able to shake it off. Yeah, maybe compared to India, we are just so, even if they left, remember, they, they did our minds, right? And it <laughs> continues <laughs> on until mm -hmm. now. There were many waves of Filipino immigrants to the United States. When the Americans, and I know Jose, you know, because you're from Puerto Rico and Puerto Rico was very much like the Philippines. But uh, when uh, the United States needed medical doctors, for example, here was a nurses, here's a wave of Filipino doctors. When they needed educators, here's the wave of Filipino uh, educators. When they needed people in, the, um, uh, in, in California as farm workers, here's the Filipinos. So in a way, America was still um, in control of the Philippines. I mean, when Marcos, who was our dictator for mm -hmm. more than 20 or about 20 years. 20 years, yeah. Something yeah. Like um, he would not leave the Philippines, even with the people power protesting against him. Mm -hmm. How did he leave? The U.S., the president of the U.S. called him and said, come on, I think it's time. We will grant you passage in Hawaii with the house, with everything else. And um, so come. So in other words, it's still very much uh, controlled by the film. Our movies, although we have good movies, but we don't have like what you have in India, Bollywood. Mm -hmm. um, many of our, again, because of, um, you know, we were trained to see Hollywood as the standard for movies. Um, white skin, for example, uh, colorism is very much so. Who are the movie stars? The movie stars are the ones who are fair. We have whitening, uh, whitening um, ointments and things like that, even up to this day. So they really have control over, still control. So we've got to be very intentional about our decolonizing, um, decolonizing process. Okay. I, I wanna I wanna add a little bit on, on that uh, because Mariana and I we discuss extensively about postcolonialism and neocolonialism. Mm -hmm. I actually added on the chat um, uh, the reason why the Philippines and Puerto Rico have that 
still today colonial mentality. And uh, it all comes down to the Supreme Court decision of 1901 known as insular cases. And let me tell you, that law still on the records, on the land, and essentially stipulated that uh, those inhabiting the territories of American Samoa, Juan, Philippines, and Puerto Rico were incapable of understanding the Anglo-Saxon values mm -hmm. and virtues. Therefore, we would declare second-class citizen. And that's how it bankrolled the whole colonial attitude of indoctrination in which that's we were it. told that we were less. And that's still today, 21st century, 2021, mm -hmm. insular cases are still quoted for determining, for example, Puerto Rico uh, current status of yeah. being a colonial state of America and essentially taxation without representation. But besides that, that's a topic of discussion for, now, I do have a very interesting question about your study and you're talking about the air quality and all, all that. Um, I wonder if there's any part of your study that looks at the physical aspect of how the groupings of building is actually affecting the microclimate, for example, wind yes. patterns, creating some sort of bubble space that yes. air could not escape. Uh, I know you were talking about the physiology of the elevation changes, mm -hmm. uh, but I'm not sure if the elevation, practical change of elevation from one end of the street to the other affect the barometric pressure, for example. Yeah. I think it's more about the building arrangement, perhaps? Yes, yes, yes. Um, initially, uh, yeah, and every time I go every, at every phase of this longitudinal study, I did look at the physical features. And yes, um, there were some streets that were narrow, but the uh, average building height was like about four or five. And the air quality was not, not very good there because it was also slanting. Okay, so it, it's all these, and not only that, land use. In, in terms of uh, those, like the ones closer to the market where uh, the jeepney stops um, would uh, be located in. And when the jeepney uh, would start and rev up, oh my goodness, all the vendors would <laughs> inhale all this exhaust. Um, so yes, we did. Um, and there are more uh, details on that. The, the vendors who were closer to the park, the Burnham Park, um, their, their uh, health conditions were much better than those that were in incline and um, more dense uh, land uses. Thank you. <laughs> Marianne, this is Ellis. I have a yes. quick question. In your presentation, you had two posters. Uh, I think it was during the time you were talking about how the culture there had been more female focused. Oh, yeah. And your two posters had one with what looked like a hummingbird yeah. and the other looked like a kind of takeoff of the Rosie the Riveter poster. And my question is, what is the significance of a hummingbird, if that's what it was, I'm not a birder, in the Philippines. And the other one is, is the Rosie the Riveter image universal enough to make the same point that it would to an American audience? Yeah, very good. Rosie the Riveter was an American icon. And when I did get the... Um, which is when I looked at that, it was by a Filipino American, not a Filipino resident who's still there. So in a way it was, but we knew about Rosie. Um, yeah, so it was an American. And then the bird, prior to the Spaniards coming and the Americans, we were very, very, close to the land, close to wildlife, that birds would, there was even, um, there are many stories where 
uh, females would actually talk to birds. They, they were communicating with birds. And so you saw the bird in the hand. How many birds uh, would actually stay in a human being's hand? Um, not very many, but at that time, because we were so linked and so intertwined, um, we did, we did that. <laughs> we were so, so close to animals and uh, wildlife. More questions. I, I'm sorry to watch you call. I mean, I don't want to ask all these questions. So, Marianne, I'm just also cu uh, curious. Like, there's a lot, lot of uh, post-colonial scholarship, like from the post-colonial perspective, which is a theory in itself, that has happened in India. And actually, Indian scholars have been leaders in doing that. So, that hasn't uh, happened in Philippines among Filipino scholars who have. That's one way to. I mean, are you the first world, first colonial mm -hmm. scholar? No, 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 no. There are there are scholars who have written about decolonization in the Philippines, mm -hmm. but they're much older now. And mm -hmm. uh, let me talk about post-colonial theorists, okay? Mm -hmm. And I intentionally delete, not deleted, uh, excluded them from my mm -hmm. book. I only I only cited scholars who are either from the global south, scholars of color, um, who understand, who have lived um, mm -hmm. in the global south, or who, uh, again, um, you know, um, who are not just theory, right? So if, they, if I see, and I, uh, I've read so much in post-colonial uh, theory, when I read something that's so up here and really did not apply to the lived experiences of the vendors, um, I excluded them. But okay. of course, there are some meta theories that I saw, but again, I had to make sure that they were applicable to the study and the lived experiences of. So, and here's one of my pet peeves, kind of, and that is decolonization is actually or, or actually started here in the United States. It was the Filipinos who here who not even the immigrants, the first generation immigrants, but it's the children of immigrants who are the voices of decolonization. And I have a problem with that. Um, one of my future books is uh, titled, You Are Not My Voice, because their voice is Filipino American. They grew up here. And so um, their decolonizing um, process is very different from mine as a, as a first generation immigrant. Um, and they just, it's, I, I have a pet peeve with that, but I'm glad that they're at least getting their minds, uh, you know, peeled off from all these uh, colonial, mm -hmm. uh, um, you know, colonial, uh, uh, how do you say this, um, ideas that are deep rooted in there. So. So we have a question in the chat from one of our um, SAMP students. Laura Bianca Pruitt, um, and she said she had to run, but she'd love if you could answer her question and then she'll watch the answer later when she watches the video again. Uh, she said, wow, the same great, the same white men who are considered to be the greats in the US, in US planning were brought in to colonize. How should we acknowledge this in planning education? Okay, yeah. So it goes back again. It, it, it all depends what you're doing with, uh, with planning education. If you are applying it to the United States, uh, you have to be very conscious of, again, the, the, the minds, the white minds that have uh, developed and constructed planning theory. But there are women too who have constructed planning theory. But we do need more theorists of color that have lived experiences 
um, that should be writing, that should be uh, reflecting, that should be uh, pondering on, um, on planning theory. Uh, or just planning in general, just our built environment in general. Um, and unless that's done, and I'm hoping that, you know, in your planning, in your planning classes that you ask those questions. Because to be honest with you, when I came here to the United States and I uh, went to Michigan State for my PhD, oh yeah, all the theories were white theorists, right? And so all these planning theories, but unless we um, also contribute to that, um, that's a problem. We need to contribute to that, but we cannot perpetuate uh, all these traditional planning theories. So I have a question and, and a comment. I, I think this is a real, uh, this is a giant topic and we, we can riff, riff for hours on and, and not necessarily solve a lot of things riffing on this colonial, post-colonial uh, perspectives. But I do think uh, two things, uh, uh, as a researcher of cities and uh, a consumer of research on cities, I think it is important to note that uh, good perspectives on cities come from multiple inputs. And uh, as I 100% I agree that we need more local boots on the ground to give us that real experience that we won't get elsewhere. However, we should also have the view of outsiders. Some of the greatest things written about cities were written by people who were visiting or um, studying from, from a distance and so on. All of my research over the last several years is all, I'm going to different places and I'm, I'm a visitor there, you know? And, and so I think it, it's important that we don't necessarily, that, that this is a fine line that we, we should perhaps embrace many different sources and that um, it's definitely a dialogue. First, mm -hmm. first point. Second, I, I like the, the, the image that you had of the new development with the towers is, is quite powerful and provocative. And I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, you, you mentioned that it's potentially it's, it's a planners that, that don't really understand that they're in this kind of the spell of post colonialism, post colonialism, right? And you see these towers, but when I look at those towers, I think this is the kind of generic global architecture of the world fueled by global capital, right? So it, you know, the planners don't necessarily love those towers. They, I don't know what the situation is like there on the ground in, in the Philippines, but in other places that I've looked at, right? That this is, it's not so much that the planners really want this, it's what, it's what the flows of capital uh, yeah. are, are demanding. And I'm wondering about, um, local development and, you know, who makes those decisions there? And, you know, is there still a lot of kind of old school corruption that fuels uh, transfers of property and, uh, you know, bank loans and the things that make those kinds of high rise, luxe global development possible? Yeah, good questions. First, first question, yes, we need to consider all perspectives. I have a problem when perspectives of just visitors or people who are not rooted in place take central, uh, take center. That's where I have a big problem. Um, I'm not saying that we shouldn't read other uh, commentators, but that's very real. I mean, if you want to elevate voices of color, local voices, then um, there are strategies to do that. But if you always center, uh, again, the, the, the visitors who come, stay for at most a week and then start writing about it as if they are experts of the place, that's where I have a problem. Um, regarding the, oh, example. 
In the Philippines now, you talk about planning. You know who they're going to quote? Jan Gell. <laughs> it's not, and I particularly put, uh, in, in my book, I address that. Because they say, oh, yeah, that's the way we make people-centered uh, spaces. I, I, uh, although they claim, he and his uh, and followers claim that uh, they go around the world, they go around the world maybe as visitors, right? Not really lived in places. But um, no, we should not use Jan Gil, 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 Gil as, our, uh, as our center for uh, making more people. Uh, we know, the local people know uh, how to make our spaces habitable um, in terms of global. You know what happens there is the government and I know this because my dad, who's a planner, used to um, uh, join a lot of these tours, uh, government tours, where they take them to Europe, basically Europe, uh, during that time. And uh, again, putting European design as the standard. And of course, when they come back, um, they teach students and they, they make decisions based on that. Um, and so again, um, I, I think we need to value really our local forms, but you know, let's be realistic. Some, that's where the money is, but why can't we elevate the discourse so that Filipinos themselves can um, discuss ways to really make it Filipino and not global. Global uh, design should not be our standard. But unfortunately, in many, in many areas, that is the standard. So. <laughs> good answer. Those are good answers. Lots for us to think about here. All right, before we close up shop here, is there anyone else out there who wants to ask a question? This, be, this, is, this should be the last question. Hi, Marianne, this is Stella. How are you? Yeah. You. I actually don't have a question. It's all of the questions kind of were answered, but I did just want to say awesome. Mm. Uh, yes, awesome. And I just wanted to say that out loud to everyone so that they could hear it. Oh. I don't know if we can afford your book yet, but. No, I don't, don't, don't. I mean, <laughs> I shouldn't say don't, but I'll give you the e version. Oh. Thank you, Mary. I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah. I, well, you know, as a sociologist, uh, I always want to say uh, I applaud you because I've been part of your transdisciplinary team. Yes, you have. And so um, the fact that you are so inclusive in all that you do, um, but it is for a purpose. And that's what I really wanted to say was I love that this is for an outcome. And this is not just to write something, but to make a difference um, and to really to truly understand the lived experience yes. of those who you're trying to impact. And we so often see that things are imposed upon people. And then we ask questions about why they don't accept it or adapt to it. And, yeah. and the reason is that we did not include them um, and so uh, this is awesome. That's, that's all I can say. Just awesome. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Stella. Um, Dan, can I have a last word? Actually, I, I do want to um, uh, address um, my friends because Lolitz, Jerry, Agnes, and Ramon, uh, Josie, we need, you need to run for politics there, okay? Let's, and I'm telling you, I'll, I'll be your campaign manager, <laughs> but we do need to help our motherland. And I really hope uh, Jerry and Agnes, may, uh, maybe you can, you can yeah, be the next woman mayor in Baguio. <laughs> so, 
again, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for taking the time. Vivian, <laughs> thank you for taking the time. And oh, wait, wait, I forget. Uh, Lily Beth. <laughs> Lina Beth, I forgot. Uh, she is in Guam, and so, so she knows very much about uh, colonization and decolonization. So Beth and Renee go home and, and run for politics. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be there for you. We'll be your Abrams. <laughs> so thank you again, everyone. Thank you. It was really enjoyable. I, I really enjoyed it. Thank you, Marianne. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Marianne. Bye. That was Thank a you, Marianne. stimulating.